Germany and Frankfurt, together with its suburb Bad Homburg vor der Höhe, have played a significant part in my youth and later in my life. This is the story about my relationship with my best friend Peter Munch, for whom I still grieve. It is also about his family history, told to me by Peter himself, so that his family has an even better understanding of where they're from, enabling them to move forward with greater confidence and joy. The Munch's Mystery House was built in 1951-1952. It was almost finished when I arrived in Frankfurt, June of 52. I was on loan from the British Metal Corporation, where I worked in London, to the Metallgesellschaft, where I met Peter for the first time. Peter and his mother, Ilse, were still living in an apartment in downtown Frankfurt when I got there. I remember spending a delightful evening there with Peter and his mother. I must go back in time to go forward. The Spice Schloss am Meer was the mansion built by Adolf Hansemann, Ilse's grandfather. It was started in 1873. Adolf was the son of David Hansemann, the founder of the famous Disconto Gesellschaft, a merchant bank. More about that later. What a glorious facade facing the Baltic on the island of Rügen. Rügen lies east of Rostock and directly south of Malmo, Sweden. The frescoed portico is decorated with plants and animals on the ceiling and walls. It's done in a sort of Pompeian style. Look closely and you can see a hooded wicker beach chair, one of the first of its kind. The door at the top of the stairs leads into the main reception room. This is a very impressive, if somewhat sterile, room. This is just an abbreviated family tree. It starts with David Hansemann, the founder of the Skanto Gesellschaft. This company, or rather this investment or merchant bank, lent monies to the German states at a probably 2 or 3% interest rate, but at a 20% discount. This was the beginning of a German empire. After David died in 1876, his son Adolf was already ensconced as the heir apparent. He married Ottilie von Kusserab in 1860. This was a Jewish lady. That, had World War II turned out differently, could have had fatal consequences for future generations of Munch. Adolf's marriage to Ottilie joined the two major investment banking companies of Hansemann and Oppenheim. Ottilie's mother was a sister of Abram Oppenheim. Along with Gerson von Bleichroda, they financed the seven-week Franco-Prussian War in 1870, for which Kaiser Wilhelm I knighted him, becoming Adolf von Hansemann. Along with other financial feats, he was on the board of Krupp and chairman of the Gelsen Kirchner Bergwerk AG, participating in the growing coal and steel Ruhr industries. He bought up, together with Bleicherode, Strasbourg's railroads on the cheap, and some in Romania and Venezuela. He also developed German Samoa and German New Guinea. The Discato Gesellschaft funded the Central Line in German East Africa, the Shantung Railroad in the German concession in Shanghai, China, and the Otaya Railroad in Southwest Africa. These are just some of the highlights of the man whose company became the largest private bank in the German Empire and one of the most famous in all of Europe. This left him one of the empire's richest men. There being no income tax at this time, allowed him the luxury of building his mansion on the island of Rügen, an estate of 100 hectares or just under 250 acres. Hartley is now what we would call a progressive liberal women's rights activist. A rector of Friedrich Wilhelm's University in Berlin, she offered 200,000 Reich marks for women students. By 1908, women were admitted, but could not aspire to professorship. In the teens, till almost today, there was a woman's residence building 
on the Otto Sur Alley in Charlottenburg, named after Ottilie von Hansemann. It's now an administration building for the Deutsche Bank. Here in the living room dining room, for the first and last time in the White House, we see little Peter about four in 1934 on his mother's lap, surrounded by duchesses. Duchess Caprivi, a relative, don't ask me how, and a friend, Duchess Giuseppina von Schlippenbach. Say that three times fast after three martinis. If you can, you're sober. In 1929, the Disconto Gesellschaft was bought by the Deutsche Bank, almost to the day of the crash on the New York Stock Exchange. In a broken deal, the great-grandson of Adolf, Gert von Oerstsen, sold the mansion for a pittance, 200,000 Reichsmarks, to the nearby city of Sassnitz in October of 1935. They, in turn, turned it over to the Nazi Kriegsmarine, it was used as a distance measuring school, part of the ship artillery school in Kiel. Links are about the rest of the apple in the mitten there, the apple clots. Clots, clots, and bind clavier form, but he lang is the chaussee. Links, links, the augen, rechts, ein blick auf die Natur, the augen, geradeaus. Links, links, links are about the rest of the apple. About this same time, the Villas Hansemann, standing side by side on the Tiergartenstrasse 30 to 31, were confiscated and destroyed by the Nazis in order to build Villa Krupp, an administrative building. An administrative building to be at the center of the Nazi government, ensuring the smooth and ever growing need for munitions for World War II. After World War II, though slightly damaged, the building and the Hansemann estate were sold to the Jesuit Kinesis College. They are the now proud owners of stolen Nazi property. This brings to a close the history of the Hansemanns on this side of the family. Now to the mystery of Munch. All any of the survivors of the marriage of Ilse von Hansemann and Caspar Hermann Munch, May 24, September 29, no, is that Caspar married Ilse. Caspar's a mystery. Who was he? Where did he come from? Who were his parents? What is his ancestry? All we know for sure, he was born in Eiserlohn on March 20th, 1885. After studying law in Freiburg, Bonn, and Berlin, he was awarded his doctorate in 1915. Yes, I know some more. Peter told me that by the beginning of World War II, he was the only Christian in an all-Jewish law firm. By then, he was the sole person in charge, as all the partners and most of the clientele had fled to London or New York City. It was obvious that he was successful, as he was on the board of directors of a number of small companies in Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and the most important one, as time would tell, Scotland. This allowed him and Ilse not only to have a nice apartment in Berlin, but to buy the vast estate in Dachau for he drove Germany's Rolls-Royce, a horse, and Ilse a convertible four-door Maybach, Germany's Bentley. According to Peter, his father was pissed, as the Maybach would outdrive his horse. Most of the time, Ilse would be in Dachau, and Tasper would stay in Berlin, only coming home on weekends with his son and nanny. Peter and his nanny stayed in Berlin, where Peter went to school, and the nanny looked after the household. So here's the path that led from the hamlet of Dachau to the estate Munch. This was on my first trip in 2000 back to Germany since 1953. I just left Prague, where I had been pickpocketed and met Peter in Dresden, staying at his favorite hotel, Martha Hospitz. I used Peter's monetary assistance and rented a car, driving to the hamlet of Dachau. Here are three views of the front of the mansion, each one, for me, an imaginary adventure in the past. For Peter, it brought back bittersweet memories and a longing for a time and space that can never be. Peter had to speak in his broken Polish to get the caretaker to open up the house, going first to a room on the ground floor that dates back to the 1450s. 
Peter admiring what was once something that can never be again. This was perhaps the dining room. Peter told me that when he was 13 or 14, his father told him to select the wine for dinner. But God help him if you make a mistake. For Peter, each step must have been a wrenching experience, evoking a multitude of memories. Peter is pointing to the Kaisersaal, the most formal room in the house, a fair-sized room with a stage for children's plays. The ceiling covered in the various familial branches of Hansemann. Up close and personal on the ceiling is the coat of arms of the von Hansemanns, intertwined with who knows who. This is the back of the main house, as seen from the second story. This is the other wing. Oh, how pitifully overgrown. These are the outbuildings for horseless carriages, horses, and major farm equipment. Here are the outbuildings nearest the house. Back in 1944, approximately, the Nazis had put a number of Russian POWs to work the fields of the Munch estate. They fed them little and gave them little or no medical attention. This situation is the start of a horrendous part of Peter's life. Being a compassionate person, he put together some basic first aid and things to give them. On his way across the property, someone had turned him in and he was arrested. He was put in jail at Glogau at age 14. His father finally found out and at the end of two months, he was tried and given time served. As he exited the jail, two men in black raincoats grabbed him, saying, You haven't learned your lesson. They hustled him into a car and drove him all the way to Berlin, to a small town north and slightly east of the city, to a place called Sachsenhausen, concentration camp. He was dumped off there, and the only thing that saved him was his blonde hair and blue eyes. The SS officer who met him said, Go to my quarters, polish my boots, and shut up, and stay there. It took six months for his father to find him, having to go through all the various bureaucratic channels. He bought him out for a 100,000 Reichsmarks, a monumental sum. They went back to Dalko, Peter sickly from his experience. But by now the war was drawing to a close, and the Russians were almost upon them. A knock on the door, an SS man says to Kasper and Peter, you come with me. You're in the army. Kaspar told him he was too old. So he took Peter, age 15, with his hunting rifle. They went off to a place not far from Drenau. More about that place later. Peter and the two other 15-year-olds were put in charge of about 50 11 to 14-year-olds. They all had to fight for their Führer und der Vaterland. The only thing on the minds of the three older boys was how to kill the SS officer. It seems that a Russian grenade took care of that. The three young leaders looked at the other kids and said, Go home! Peter returned to Dalkow with the Russians almost at the door. The first Russians that came through were okay. It was the second wave, together with the instant Polish communists, that made the Munch family Flüchtlinge, or refugees. They were given one hour to gather their belongings and get out. With a bag of peace... Kaspar, Ilza, Peter, and Peter's nanny piled onto an Ackerwagen, a hay cart, pulled by a horse and a cow. That's all they had left. It took them two weeks to get to a place near Cottbus. At this checkpoint, the Russians took the animals and the Ackerwagen away and stuck them in the attic of a barn together with 200 other refugees and fed them once a day with a Gulaschwagen. Somehow... The munches slipped away unnoticed from the rest. Somewhere down the road, they found another Ackerwagen, but no animals this time. Kaspar, a sickly man, rode on it while the others pushed and pulled. They traveled southward for a couple of days before reaching an unnamed cousin's house. There they stayed for at least a week. Kaspar and Ilse decided to get somehow back to Berlin to see what was left of their apartment. They walked to a nearby freight train yard, hopped a coal car back to Berlin, leaving a sickly Peter and his nanny to follow later. This respite for Peter allowed him to build up strength for the coal car ride back to Berlin. He left the nanny and the luggage at the Berlin freight yard 
and walked back to find, to his surprise, his parents in their basically untouched apartment. How the Munch family survived during this time, Peter never told me. Peter had to get back to school, and in the afternoons, he worked as a busboy in the officer's mess at a nearby RAF station. One day, on his way home from the RAF station, as he approached the apartment, his heart stopped. There were two British staff cars parked outside. This was not a good omen. Was his father to be arrested for God only knows what? What was going to happen? His fear turned to joy as he found out his father and mother were to be shipped off to Wolfsburg, where his father took on the job of the first CEO of Volkswagen under the British. Peter's father was selected, at least based on the fact that he had industrial financial experience, having been a director on a number of small companies in Europe, and in particular one in Scotland. More importantly, he paid off a person in the Gestapo to keep his dossier clean. This proved life-saving, as he was part of the assassination plot against Hitler. No doubt MI6 vetted all this information before he was approved for the position of CEO of Volkswagen. Peter remained in Berlin to finish his abitur. His nanny stayed to look after him till he joined his parents in Wolfsburg. At this point, the nanny left the Munch's employ and sought her family back in Hamburg. Time went on till the night before Volkswagen was turned over by the British to the Germans at the end of 1947. Heinrich Nordhoff, Munch's technical advisor, and his unnamed wife, and his two young daughters, Barbara, who was married to a Conte Casino, Barbara now dead, and Elizabeth, married to a P.H., who was a relative of Ferdinand Porsche, still alive, went to dinner at the Munches. The next day, in the VW's boardroom, Major Hurst and other British officers sat on one side of the table, and Munch and Heinrich Nordhoff in two chairs on the other side. The crook, Major Hurst, offered Munch a list of major VW potential distributors for his approval. Munch questioned some of their integrity and declined to approve. When Nordhoff was offered the list for his approval, he approved. Hearst turned to Munch and said, I think you'd better plan for a job elsewhere. With that, Munch walked out of the meeting and walked out of VW. Kasper's betrayal was not unusual. It was said in post-war Germany, you climbed the corporate ladder with a dagger in each hand. The family Munch moved to an apartment in Frankfurt in 1948. Kasper's health was in decline, though he kept himself busy by trying to restore life into the Berliner Handelsgesellschaft. Meanwhile, the German partners and clientele of the Berlin law firm, now living in London and New York City, contacted him. They wanted him to reclaim their assets stolen by the Nazis. In exchange, they flew Peter to New York City to a hospital for two months and back again, free of charge. Plus, they gave the family enough money to build the present house, completed in the summer of 1952. Plus, a VW Cabriolet for Ilse and a Fiat Topolino 500 convertible for Peter. Sadly, Kaspar Hermann Munch died in March of 1951. It was in June of 52 that the British Metal Corporation, for whom I worked, temporarily seconded me to Metallgesellschaft in Frankfurt, where I first met your father, Peter. One of my first memories was being invited to their apartment for a delightful formal dinner. Before I went home for Christmas that year, Peter took me to a wine wholesaler's basement, where he and the cellar master instructed me on the six bottles of wine I brought back with me to England. Peter's dictum of wine buying at that time was, I'll never pay anything more than five D marks. This ends one chapter of the Munch family's history. Another with